and welcome. I'm Katherine Banwell, your host for today's program. In today's webinar, we'll discuss how you can access the most personalized metastatic breast cancer therapy for your individual disease and why it's vital to insist on key testing. Before we meet our guest, let's review a few important details. The reminder email you received about this program contains a link to program materials. If you haven't already, click that link to access information to follow along during the webinar. At the end of this program, you'll receive a link to a program survey. Please take a moment to provide feedback about your experience today in order to help plan future webinars. And finally, before we get into the discussion, please remember that this program is not a substitute for seeking medical advice. All right, let's meet our guest today. Joining us is Dr. Jane Mizell. Dr. Mizell, welcome. Would you please introduce yourself? Absolutely, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Jane Mizell, and I'm a medical oncologist at the Winship Cancer Institute at Emory University. I've been here for about six years, and before that, I uh, did my training in Boston and at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. And I specialize in breast cancer um, and have, a, have had a lot of great opportunities to treat amazing patients and participate in a lot of research. Um, and I'm looking forward to having this discussion with you today. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. So let's start by discussing the latest developments in treatment and research updates. Are there recent developments you feel breast cancer patients should know about? Absolutely. And I think you know, it's really been such a remarkable time because even during COVID, you know, a pandemic where I think a lot of people worried that research efforts would shut down or stall, um, we've still seen the approval of a number of drugs in the past year that have really already markedly changed lives. Um, and a lot of important findings that have come out of other trials um, that, have, that have the opportunity to do that as well. I think some of the biggest information that was presented at our most recent large meeting, which was the American Society of Clinical Oncology or ASCO national meeting in 2021, um, were a few things that pertain to the metastatic breast cancer population. One was two studies, the Paloma 3 trial and the Mona Lisa 3 trial, which looked at a, a class of drugs called CDK4-6 inhibitors, along with anti-estrogen pills in metastatic estrogen positive breast cancer, and really confirmed for patients that not only do these drugs improve the amount of time that people can stay on treatment before their cancer progresses, but actually improve how long people live. Even when they're used very, very early on in treatment, they impact survival down the line for many, many years. Um, so it really confirms for physicians like me that this, this class of drugs should be used as the standard of care in first line for patients with estrogen positive stage four breast cancer. I think that's important for patients to know. Um, along those lines, there's a drug called sasituzumab gobatecan or Tridelvi, which is a much easier to say name, yes. <laughs> um, a new antibody drug conjugate in triple negative metastatic breast cancer. Um, and it's, we've also seen, you know, that since this drug was approved last year, it has markedly changed the lives of many patients with triple negative disease. Um, and this, the study called the ASCENT trial, um, which was what led to that drug's approval, um, was studied sort of further. And some of these addi additional results presented at ASCO this year and found that this drug not only improves, again, how long people get before they have to move on to another treatment, but actually improves how long people live as well, even when given later on in the course of therapy. So again, you know, really encouraging news, especially in triple negative metastatic disease, which is hard to treat. And I think another study that's really worth um, you know, patients and doctors taking a hard look at was actually a study that looked at sort of patient outcomes and patient kind of the patient experience. Um, this was a study that actually talked with metastatic patients um, and gathered their views on treatment-related adverse effects. Um, talked to patients about what kinds of adverse effects they were experiencing from drugs, how they managed those adverse effects, and found that most patients, over 90%, would be willing to talk about reducing the dose of drugs or changing dosing schedules in order to improve quality of life. And I think that's really important because a lot of times the doses of drugs that get approved are the doses that are sort of the highest doses that don't cause extreme toxicity. But sometimes people can have effective, you know, really good outcomes on lower doses um, and have much better quality of life. And in, in metastatic breast cancer, where really the goal oftentimes is to help people live as long as they can but also really importantly, as well as they can, being able to have those open-ended conversations between patients and doctors about you know, what's really impacting your quality of life now and how can we make that better um, is important. And this study, I think, really highlighted that both for patients and physicians, how important that back and forth is to having a successful outcome, um, you know, both in terms of how long life is lived, but in terms of the quality of that life. Right, right. How can patients stay up to date on developing research? You know, it's so interesting because there is so much coming out. And I think sometimes it can be hard to figure out, you know, what, 
phase one study that looks exciting is really going to become something versus, you know, what really could be important in my treatment today. And what I always tell people is actually the NCI website. So the National Cancer Institute has a phenomenal page um, looking at advances in breast cancer research. So if you Google NCI advances in breast cancer research, there's a, there's a great page that comes up and it's impressively up to date. And I think very patient friendly um, breaks things down into early stage um, and metastatic. And then in the metastatic section talks about estrogen positive, HER2 positive, triple negative, which we can talk more about today, but are kind of the three big subtypes of metastatic disease that dictate how we treat them. And then have links to all the different you know, research updates and talk about what these drugs are, what, you know, what the classes are and what the settings are in which they were studied. Um, and so I think that's a really great like first stop. And then the links can take you to all sorts of different stuff that's on the page that you might want to look into more in depth. Um, and then also the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, which is a phenomenal organization. They have a great website too. And if you click around on that website, you can see not only you know, who they've donated money to that's doing promising research, um, but they also have podcasts. They have a blog with science and research news. Um, I think that's a really great site for patients to use to stay updated. Let's shift gears for a moment and talk about another time-sensitive topic, COVID. Right. Yes. Now that vaccines are available, are they safe and effective for breast cancer patients? Yeah, you know, I think the short answer to that is yes, absolutely. Um, I'm encouraging all my patients, no matter what their treatment status is, to go ahead and get vaccinated. I think you know we are seeing now sort of this third surge in COVID um, with cases rising all over the country um, and really among unvaccinated populations. And with the Delta variant being more transmissible, I think it's all the more time, you know, even if you haven't considered vaccination till up until now, to really go ahead and strongly consider getting a vaccine. Yeah. Um, you know, I think some of the hesitations people have talked to me about are that there were not a lot of active cancer patients, if any, included in the initial trials. Um, and whereas that, you know, that is true, it's still the case that, you know, now so many cancer patients have been vaccinated. We haven't really heard about adverse effects in vaccine in vaccination being, you know, something that's higher in patients who've gotten who have cancer, who are on active treatment. I think the one challenge is if you have a compromised immune system because of cancer treatment, there's the possibility that you may not mount the same immune response to the vaccine as someone who doesn't have cancer or who isn't getting active treatment. So while I would say, you know, yes, definitely get vaccinated, I would also at the same time encourage caution in saying, you know, because you might not mount the same, you know, 95% or whatever immune response, it may still be a good idea to wear a mask when you go to the grocery store, you know, kind of taking those precautions because, you know, no one really knows what's coming and it's better to be safe than sorry. Right. Um, but I think we will get a lot of information as the months go on about, you know, do we need boosters? Who might need boosters more soon than others? Um, and some of that will kind of get clarified for us. But, um, you know, my short answer would be yes, vaccine. Mm -hmm. Excellent, that's, that's uh, very helpful. Thank you. Since yeah. this webinar is focused on metastatic disease, would you define metastatic breast cancer for us? Absolutely. And I think, you know, metastatic breast cancer is one of those terms that as doctors, we throw around a lot and oftentimes don't stop to check understanding as to what that means. And what metastatic breast cancer is and means is breast cancer that is spread outside of the breast and surrounding lymph nodes to another organ system. So metastatic breast cancer, some of the most common places where it spreads are to the bone, to the skin, to the lung, to the liver, to the brain. Um, there are other places it can spread to. I've seen it you know, on the ovaries, in the GI tract, um, but basically when breast cancer spreads outside of the breast and surrounding lymph nodes to another organ system, that's when we consider it metastatic. How can a patient ensure they're getting an accurate diagnosis? Another good question. And I think you know, the most important thing when you're considering you know, whether or not you have a diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer um, is to get a biopsy of that metastatic site. So you wouldn't want to assume just based on like a CT scan that shows something in the bone that you have metastatic disease. Ideally, we would biopsy that spot um, you know, or some spot that was indicative of metastatic disease to actually prove that there is metastatic cancer in that distant site. Um, because sometimes it's nothing, you know, sometimes you get scans and a little bone, you know, abnormality, maybe a scar from a prior fall. Um, and then also sometimes if it is metastatic, sometimes the breast cancer, like the, the hormone receptor status, for example, can change from the primary site to the metastatic site, and that might impact treatment. Um, so it's important to both get a metastatic biopsy to confirm diagnosis and also to kind of understand what the treatment plan might be. Mm -hmm. And I think also for patients, you know, just to make sure that you understand what your stage is, ask your doctor, say, what is my stage? Um, because sometimes, you know, doctors think people understand and they don't actually. So checking that understanding is important. But if your doctor or provider is not 
actively checking your understanding, you can check it with them to make sure, you know, that if you are metastatic or, or have stage four disease, which is another way we define metastatic or, or talk about metastatic cancer, um, that you make sure you have a definition right. Right, right. So once someone has been diagnosed with metastatic disease, are there key tests that are used to help understand how their disease may behave and progress? Absolutely. So I think, you know, the first thing, as I said, is that metastatic biopsy. Um, another thing that's very important is understanding the hormone receptor status and the HER2 status of the breast cancer. Um, and probably for a lot of you listening, if you have, you know, listened to metastatic breast cancer webinars before, or maybe know someone or have had a diagnosis yourself, you're well-versed in this. But for some who may not be, I think a quick overview is maybe helpful. Um, breast cancer can be divided into three different subtypes. Um, so triple negative, estrogen positive, or HER2 positive. Um, and estrogen positive breast cancer is the most common kind. Um, that tends to be driven by hormones and often treated with what we call endocrine therapy. So kind of like anti-estrogen pills, things like tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors are examples of that. Um, and that's one kind. Then there's HER2 positive breast cancer, which is um, a, a type of breast cancer that overexpresses a marker called HER2. Um, and we now, since we know about that marker, have been able to develop a lot of different treatments um, that sort of target HER2 selectively and can be used to treat that subtype. And then triple negative is basically estrogen negative, progesterone negative, and HER2 negative. Um, and that type of breast cancer traditionally was treated essentially only with chemotherapy. Um, but now we've had some breakthroughs, which we'll talk about, I think, later on in this program, looking at immunotherapy and more targeted therapy for that. Um, but those subtypes kind of help determine how we treat patients. And it also can sometimes predict behavior. Um, I would say one of the other things that helps us predict behavior of metastatic disease is if a patient had early stage disease before, how quickly they developed metastatic disease. So for example, someone who develops estrogen positive metastatic breast cancer 12 years out from their original diagnosis is statistically likely to have a slower progressing course of disease than someone who develops like triple negative metastatic disease very soon after their initial treatment. So I'd say yeah, that's kind of the primary thing we look at um, in terms of determining treatment plan and then um, predicting overall course. Right. Well, let's talk about treatment options for yeah. advanced disease. Can you review the types of treatments available for metastatic breast cancer? Absolutely. And I think what I'll do is I'll give you a broad overview. And then, you know, I think there, because there's so much, and this is such a rich environment. I mean, I give, you know, hour long lectures just about the treatment of metastatic triple negative breast cancer to our fellows. So there's so much, you know, meaty information here, but I'll give an overview, you know, with some key buzzwords. So then people can go look up things that, you know, matter more to them or interest them more. Um, right. So, as I said, you know, we sort of start with thinking about is this a hormone receptor positive or estrogen positive breast cancer? Is this HER2 positive or is this triple negative? And those factors really kind of send us down different paths. So if someone is estrogen positive, I had mentioned before the Paloma and Mona Lisa studies showing that CDK4-6 inhibitors, which is a class of drugs that the first one was approved in 2015 and then two others have been approved subsequently. So relatively new drugs, um, but that those drugs, which are pills, added to traditional anti-estrogen therapy, which would be aromatase inhibitors or fulvestrin, um, are often great first-line options for these patients. Um, and people can do well for years on just that alone with estrogen-positive metastatic breast cancer. Um, on average, you know, about two years before people progress and need something new. And then after that, there are lots of trials ongoing looking at different ways in which an estrogen-positive breast cancer might progress on that regimen and how do we sort of target that um, so that there are multiple other anti-estrogen options down the line that people can use in estrogen-positive breast cancer before they need to even think about going on to something like chemotherapy. Um, so really, you know, lots and lots of options for those patients, but probably starting um, with a CDK4-6 inhibitor plus anti-estrogen combination. Um, and then in, in HER2 positive breast cancer, typically the first line treatment would be um, what we call monoclonal antibodies directed at HER2. So something like Herceptin and Progetta, which you may have heard of, and often combined with chemotherapy. But again, this is one of those areas that is also very, um, you know, I think the art of medicine is really important and patient dependent. Um, some of these regimens depend a little bit on you know, patient's age and other medical problems and desires, um, you know, whether to include chemotherapy along with that frontline um, anti-HER2 regimen, or whether to think about, you know, something like anti-estrogen therapy if the patient is HER2 positive and estrogen positive. And then there are a lot of other different things we're also using in HER2 positive disease after patients progress on that initial therapy. So there are what we call antibody drug conjugates, where a chemotherapy-like drug is sort of attached to an antibody that then 
brings the chemo to the HER2 positive cell and kind of allows for chemotherapy penetration more directly. Um, and then a class of drugs called tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which are oral drugs um, that get are directed at HER2. So another really you know, exciting area to treat in a place where we've seen so many advances. And then in triple negative breast cancer, I'd mentioned that you know, chemotherapy really has been the mainstay of treatment historically um, because there weren't great targets. Um, but recently we've seen that immunotherapy along with chemotherapy, drugs like Keytruda, which you may have heard of, um, or a tazolizumab, which is tocentric, um, can be used along with chemo in patients that overexpress a molecule called PDL1. Um, and that can actually improve not just, again, how long patients spend on the first treatment, but how long they live. So we're seeing a lot of triple negative patients being great candidates for immunotherapy based regimens now. And then for patients who have inherited a, a BRCA gene mutation, which many of you may have heard of, um, that gene mutation can actually predispose a triple negative patient to be more receptive to a class of drugs called PARP inhibitors. Um, so drugs like olaparib or talazoparib um, are new drugs that have been approved in the last couple of years in triple negative metastatic breast cancer for patients who carry a BRCA1 mutation or BRCA2 mm -hmm. mutation. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are also antibody drug conjugates in triple negative breast cancer as well. Um, the Tridelvi that's been approved. Um, and then of course, um, others that are in clinical trials currently. So as you can see, it's complex. I mean, the treatment of metastatic breast cancer is complicated. Um, and so it's important, I think, to really be able to have a dialogue with your provider about, you know, what they're recommending for you and why. Um, and I think, you know, there are, there are often lots of options. And so as much as you can make your doctor kind of aware of what matters to you in terms of, you know, what side effects are you most afraid of, or, you know, would you like most to avoid what kind of dosing schedules, you know, would be ideal for your schedule for the rest of your life, um, you know, so that you can deal with taking kids to school or the job that you're currently working on or whatever, um, I think helps, helps your doctor help you come up with the right regimen for you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what factors are considered when deciding on the best treatment pro approach for an individual patient? So I think certainly, you know, the tumor type, like we talked about, is it estrogen positive or triple negative or HER2 positive? Um, I think response to past treatments, both in terms of, you know, how, if someone has had metastatic disease for a long time and has had a few treatments already, how long did they respond to those treatments and how completely did they respond to those treatments? You know, did they just have sort of stable disease for a while or did their cancer actively shrink? Um, and then I think, you know, other than that, it would be sort of some of the things I've touched on, um, you know, side effect profiles, you know, do patients have pre-existing neuropathy from other chemotherapy? If so, maybe you want to avoid a regimen that causes more neuropathy, um, schedule, you know, some patients, it's really important to be on a certain schedule as opposed to a different schedule. Um, I think whether there are clinical trials available instead of whatever the standard of care regimen would be, or is also important. Um, because for some patients, you know, who are interested in sort of pushing the envelope or who might be a great candidate for a particular trial, if there is one that they're a candidate for, that's, you know, not horribly inconvenient, um, from a logistics standpoint, then trials, I think are also a great option to consider. So I think, you know, from a effectiveness standpoint, you want to think about the tumor type response to past treatments. Um, and then potentially if the patient has had what we call genomic profiling, where the tumor has been sent for um, basically genomic analysis to see what genes might be mutated in the tumor that could potentially drive a response to a new or different therapy. Um, all those things could be taken into account as we think about the cancer, but then there's sort of the patient specific factors. And I think those would be mainly side effects, schedule, clinical trials and desire or not to pursue those. Um, and then, you know, just kind of what the patient's perspective is on the plan that you're offering them. Mm -hmm. What is biomarker testing and how do results impact treatment options? Great question. So I think, you know, people often confuse germline mutations and somatic mutations. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit as we talk about biomarkers. So I think, you know, biomarkers in general are factors within the tumor that allow us to help make treatment decisions. So if a biomarker in the tumor can predict response to a certain type of treatment, we want to know what that biomarker is so that we can, you know, better treat the patient and kind of more elegantly design a regimen. So for example, having an estrogen positive tumor, estrogen positivity is a biomarker suggestive of response to anti-estrogen treatments, which is why we give anti-estrogen therapy to ER positive breast cancers. But more recently, we've sort of, you know, been able to move a little bit beyond estrogen, HER2 and triple negative as sort of our, you know, our subtypes and think a little bit more in some patients about more sophisticated biomarkers. And that's where somatic mutation testing comes in. So there are germline mutations, which are inherited mutations that are present in every cell of your body. Um, so for example, if your mother was a BRCA mutation carrier 
and pass that BRCA mutation down to you, you would have a germline BRCA mutation. So your cancer would carry a BRCA mutation, but so would every other cell you have. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a biomarker that would make you a candidate for a treatment with something like a PARP inhibitor. But in cancers, which, you know, kind of the genes and the cancer have gone awry by definition, there are often other biomarkers within that tumor that may make you a candidate for certain treatments. And so those mutations that arise in the cancer itself are called somatic mutations. Those are mutations in the tumor, can't be passed down to your offspring or anything like that, and were not inherited by your parents, um, but mutations that have accumulated over time as these cancer cells have, have kind of gone awry. And so genomic testing or biomarker testing can be done often on a metastatic specimen. So to be specific about it, say you had a metastatic uh, breast cancer to the liver. You could have a liver biopsy done and that tissue from the liver biopsy could be sent for genomic testing. There are a lot of companies that do this. um, And then there are also some larger cancer centers that actually do in-house testing um, for genomics. And so this testing can be done. And what it does then um, is helps you determine, you know, do you have a biomarker that predisposes you to a certain treatment? So if that, if that metastatic liver um, tissue, for example, contained um, high levels of PDL1 expression, for example, and you were triple negative, that would say to your doctor, ooh, this is a great candidate for immunotherapy along with chemotherapy. Um, or if you're estrogen positive, for example, and your tumor contains a mutation in a gene called PIK3CA, then that make, might make you a candidate for a drug called alpelacid. So these mutations can often be kind of paired to a drug or treatment option, or sometimes to a clinical trial um, to allow patients to kind of take advantage of more targeted therapies that sometimes because they're targeted have fewer side effects than drugs that are a little more indiscriminate. Mm-hmm. Marie sent in this question prior to the program. Yeah. Are there some genetic tests that are more accurate than others? You know, it's a good question. I would say, you know, most genetic testing p- platforms have been heavily vetted and approved by, you know, national organizations and laboratories and have been um, tested multiple times before they're allowed to you know, be marketed. So I wouldn't say that one genetic testing program is necessarily better than another. Um, I think that any of the commercially available platforms that are used are, are probably pretty accurate. Okay. How does symptom management play into the treatment decision? Uh, I would say, I was just going to add one thing. To okay. that, but that's okay. I would say that I think it's important when you're using genetic testing platforms though, to know what you're testing for. So there are some platforms that will just test for say, like the three most common mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2 that Ashkenazi Jews have. Um, and so if you get that testing back and you're negative, you might think, oh, I don't have a mutation in those genes. What we know from that testing, just as an example, is that you don't have a mutation in those three alleles of that gene. But if you haven't had full gene sequencing, you you could have a mutation somewhere else in that gene. So I would say, you know, all genetic testing that's commercially available is probably pretty accurate, but it is important when you get testing done to know what you're testing for and what you're not testing for so you can interpret your results accurately. Um, And genetic counselors, as well as your doctors can help you do that. Right, right. Okay, I'm going to ask the question, this question again. How does symptom management play into the treatment decision? I think symptom management is huge because like I said, and I tell this to all my patients, you know, at the outset of treatment that, you know, most of the time metastatic breast cancer is, you know, kind of becomes a chronic diagnosis for a patient. You're dealing with it essentially like a chronic illness for the rest of your life. Um, And you're on some form of treatment for the most part, you know, for the foreseeable future. And so making sure quality of life is as good as it can be is critically important. And I think symptom management is a huge part of that. And we know that if we can treat and manage symptoms well, people can live better and often live longer because then they can you know, stay on treatment um, for more extensive periods of time comfortably. Mm-hmm. And so I always encourage patients, you know, don't be a martyr. Don't think you have to just bounce in here and tell me everything's okay if it's not okay. Um, you know, if you're having symptoms and side effects from the treatment or from the cancer, I wanna know about them so that we can really you know, aggressively manage those symptoms, just like we're aggressively managing the cancer. Um, you know, a lot of times oncologists can do that on their own. You know, we are pretty well-versed in managing a lot of symptoms and side effects, but a lot of times also there are teams of doctors either who do palliative care or here at Emory, we call it supportive oncology, where they are specially trained in things like pain management and in managing, you know, more common side effects like nausea, constipation, diarrhea, appetite suppression, you know, that can kind of go along with cancer and with treatments. Um, and then they often will co-manage patients with us as well, just to make sure there's that really strong focus on maintaining as much of a low symptom burden as possible. Dr. Mizell, you mentioned earlier clinical trials. Mm-hmm. When should patients consider participating in a trial? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. And I think the answer is, you know, really 
almost any time. There are trials in every setting. So I think one of the common misconceptions about clinical trials is that, you know, you really only should be in a clinical trial or your doctor might only mention a clinical trial if they don't have other options for you or if you're really end stage. And I think that perception is changing. um, But I think the reality is that, you know, there are clinical trials in every setting. So we have clinical trials looking at prevention of breast cancer, clinical trials looking to optimize early stage treatment of breast cancer, um, clinical trials looking at secondary prevention. So once you've had breast cancer, how can we reduce your risk of recurrence? And then lots of clinical trials in the metastatic setting, you know, both for patients who are initially diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, and then in you know, second, third, fourth line, and even for patients who've had tons and tons of additional therapy um, that we're looking at new drugs for. So I think you know, at, at almost any juncture where you're making a treatment change, it's probably appropriate to say, would there be a clinical trial that you can think of that would be good for me in this setting? Um, and it may be that there's one that's like 12 hours away and it's not convenient for you or feasible. It may be that your doctor doesn't necessarily know of one, but then that prompts them to ask a colleague who may be more you know, involved in clinical trial design and development. Um, or it may be that there is one, but you ultimately choose not to pursue it because you have a different option. Um, but I think it's always appropriate to sort of ask, would there be a trial for me? Because if there is, then maybe that opens up an option you hadn't thought about before. Sure. For patients who aren't familiar with the stages of clinical trials, would you give us a a brief overview of the stages? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So in terms of clinical trials that are being done in humans, we talk about phase one, phase two, and phase three, typically. Um, So a phase one clinical trial is typically an earlier stage trial um, looking at either a drug that has not been tested in humans before or a drug that has not been tested in in a particular combination in humans before. And so those trials are done only at select institutions, usually academic institutions as opposed to private hospitals. Um, And they often have what's called a dose finding phase and then a dose escalation phase. So er the earliest part of those trials is actually looking at what is the safest dose to give to patients. So they start the first patients at a low dose of the compound. Then if those patients do well, the next patients that are enrolled get enrolled at, you know, a slightly higher dose, and then up until they you know, reach sort of the highest dose they can find where people are tolerating it and you know, doing reasonably well. And in those phase one trials, doctors and investigators are also evaluating efficacy, like is this drug working? But the primary goal of that early phase trial is actually to find the right dose to then study in larger groups. And so if the, they find the right dose and there's good biological rationale for the compound, then the trial would go on to a phase two, um, which might be just um, like a, what we call a single arm phase two study where there's every patient is getting that experimental drug um, and you know, kind of being monitored then to see is the drug effective or is it less effective than the standard of care? Or sometimes they're what we call randomized phase two trials where patients are randomized to either get the experimental drug or to get um, what the standard of care would be in that situation. I think a lot of people get afraid about the idea of a randomized trial because they're afraid they're gonna be randomized to a placebo. Um, And that is really not done in the metastatic setting because it wouldn't be ethical to give a patient with active cancer a placebo. So usually the randomization would be either to the study compound or to a standard of care drug. Um, And then if things look good in a phase two trial, then a phase three study is done, which is usually kind of what the FDA requires to allow a drug to go on and be, you know, administered outside of a study, um, you know, for approval. And those phase three trials tend to be larger studies that are done in bigger groups of patients um, with sort of more statistical validity because of their size to determine, you know, is this drug really better than the standard? Right. Yeah. We have another question we received earlier, this one from Eileen. She asks, how will I know whether my treatment is working? It's a really good question. So I think, you know, for patients who have symptoms from their cancer, Um, they often will know the the drug is working because their symptoms improve. You know, say if you have lung metastases and you are short of breath and your shortness of breath gets better, that's a really good sign that the treatment is working. Um, I would say that often what we are doing, you know, and it depends a little bit on the regimen and, you know, what the patient is getting and how often they're coming in. Um, But we're checking labs as well. And sometimes there are lab abnormalities when a patient is diagnosed with metastatic cancer that can then improve over time. So for example, if someone has a heavy burden of bone involvement with breast cancer, there's a lab value called the alkaline phosphatase that will often be elevated. If that starts elevated and comes down, that's a really good sign. Um, And some of their their liver function tests that we check, and if a patient has liver metastases, we often will see those come down if a patient is responding. There are also um, what we call tumor markers that we can check in patients with metastatic breast cancer. Um, those would be like proteins in the blood, basically, that can be made by the breast cancer in abundance. Um, those are called CA2729 and CA153. 
Um, some doctors check both of them. Some will just check one, depending on which one their laboratory at their institution is running. Um, but typically I will check those at diagnosis of metastatic disease. And then if it's elevated, I know it's a good marker to follow for my patient. And then I'll follow that you know, monthly or every three weeks, depending on when the patient is coming in to see me. And if I see that marker start to go down, it's not an absolute, but it can be a good early indicator of um, improvement with the treatment. Mm-hmm. And then you know, I think it varies also a little bit from practice to practice and based on patient preference. Um, but often there will be scans done when a patient is initially diagnosed to kind of determine the extent of the disease. So usually like a CT scan of the chest and the abdomen and the pelvis Um, or a PET scan, which some of you may have heard of, either one of those is good. Um, And that can be done, you know, about every 12 weeks, usually in the beginning to make sure a patient's responding. And once you feel confident that they are, those can be done less frequently. Um, So I would say the scans and the lab work, and then just the patient's overall condition are usually the way that we look to see, are we having a response or not? Mm -hmm. We've talked about several key tests some patients may be confused about whether they've received these tests. So what questions should they ask their physician to make sure that they're getting appropriate testing? You know, I think it's probably useful because, you know, not everybody needs every test. And I think, you know, there are often things you hear about, you know, online or from friends or even in a webinar like this, and there may be a good reason why you haven't had that particular test. So I wouldn't assume, you know, that just if you haven't had everything we've talked about today, even that like someone's made a mistake or that you need that and aren't getting it. But I would ask, you know, I think it's always helpful to know more. Knowledge is power. Um, And so if you have never had, you know, a CT scan or a CA2729 level or genomic testing, I think it's not a bad thing. Uh, You know, if you're curious about it to just ask your your treating team, you know, hey, I heard about genomic testing. Um, Is there a reason I haven't had that? Or have I had that? Maybe you have and, you know, they called it something else. You know, I think it is it is complicated, but I think it helps to understand what you've had done and what you haven't had done. And sometimes asking about something like that um, may prompt the team to do, to do things that may benefit you. Mm-hmm. Before we wrap up, Dr. Mizell, how do you feel about the future of breast cancer research? And what would you like patients to know? Yeah, I think one of the most important things, and I actually said this to a family this morning who, where a loved one had received a new diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer, is that the field has evolved so much over the past five years. Um, you know, I think often when people get a diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer, you know, it's, it's the most dreadful feeling they've ever had. And they remember that day for the rest of their lives. But we are seeing so many people do so well for so long now and, and tolerate treatment well because the treatments are better tolerated. And there's, I think, more, more attention being paid now to symptom management um, that people really can do so much better than they've been doing. Um, and I would say, you know, really every year, even every six months, um, when I go to give a lecture on a topic in metastatic breast cancer, I can't just give the same talk. I'm always having to update my slides because there's so many new things coming out, so much new research on the table. Um, and we're seeing you know, so many new drug approvals now that we're starting to unlock some of these new mutations and you know, reasons for progression and understanding new drug classes. So I think it really is a very bright time uh, to be in breast cancer research. And you know, there's never been a better time to be a patient if you have to fall into that category. It all sounds so promising, Dr. Mizell. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, you're so welcome. Thank you for having me. And thank you to all of our partners. If you would like to watch this webinar again, there will be a replay available soon. You'll receive an email when it's ready. Also, don't forget to take the survey immediately following this webinar. It will help us as we plan future programs. To learn more about breast cancer and to access tools to help you become a proactive patient, visit powerfulpatients.org. I'm Catherine Banwell. Thanks for joining us.